Chase 2-7 on scene. Port side recovery. It's the dog days of summer in the Pacific Northwest. Heads up! Tensions rise with the temperatures when a fishing boat threatens to capsize on the Columbia River. Sir, you need to move right up here. Watch out, get up, get up, get up. The action heats up when a crew attempts a daring hoist of a severely injured logger. About 60 feet, I can see the panic in his eyes. And it's trial by fire when the sole female pilot at Sector Columbia River takes on her first case. It took a lot of training for me to get to this point kind of nerve-wracking because they're depending on you. That is correct. We're losing the battle here. High peaks and tumultuous waters make Cape Disappointment and the Pacific Northwest one of the most hazardous environments in North America. At the heart of it all is the Columbia River Bar. This deadly area has taken countless vessels and claimed hundreds of lives. In the air and on the sea, brave men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their own safety so that others may live in a place known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. I'm Anthony Maringolo, Coast Guard Station, Cape Disappointment. We received a report around uh, 12 o'clock midnight of a, uh, a vessel that had struck a buoy. It's in the Oahu Canal. You come through the hole of the rock, walk towards the Coast Guard Station, and there's a little lady buoy at Slow The vessel had struck a buoy five, and it comes to find out that the ace navigation team had recently dropped a buoy five in the Oahu Channel. It's going on, 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 it's
As we start pulling him again, his starboard quarter starts to go underwater. That's bad for us, bad for him. We don't know exactly where all his bilge accesses are, and we don't want his bilge to fill up with water. Once he gets clear of this, we're going to shift around. I'm going to get onto his starboard side. I told the crew we were going to come alongside to try to put the boat in a side tow to keep it from rolling over. Ship vendors, lines in the water. As the tide goes back out to the Pacific Ocean, it's basically just getting more shallow and more shallow. And uh, listing to starboard like he was, it wouldn't be too long before that boat, if not tended to, would then lay down over on its starboard side in the sand. Oh, man. Hey, Skipper, you need to settle down and listen to me. Slide it in two. Oh, Sir, you hit him right up here. You Sir, I understand. Your safety is number one here. I cannot have you in between these two boats. You have two very large vessels, both under strain. If someone were to slip and fall in between the boats, you would be crushed. There's, there's no nice way to put it. I got slack in two. During the course of this case, the helo was launched, and they got on scene, and they put themselves into a hover about 200 yards behind this vessel. 6035, Sector Columbia River. It has been requested you remain on scene just in case of. Sector 6035, Roger. The side tow that we put the vessel in was, believe it or not, well choreographed. Yes, the gentleman had rigging that was down. The boat was listing very hard to starboard. It was getting entangled in our antennas and on our buoyancy chamber. But we all worked very well together. And what we were trying to do was to keep that gentleman from listing more to starboard than he would have. Take that line off your stern. We got our knife edge, the side of the boat, up underneath his gunnel. And we were keeping him from listing harder. All right, he's still sitting on the shoal, guys. Watch out, get up, get up, get up. Line's fading out fast. Put a working turn on, we'll try this again. When we put the vessel back into a bow-to-bow -to -bow tow or an inverted tow, it's very dangerous. It was an older made boat. The cleats on deck probably were not very sound. And having a line connecting both boats and the strain on that line, if that cleat were to let go, you're going to have a snapback. And uh, it's not good. Snapbacks can cut people in half. Sir, get back! Every time we pull on him, his starboard side goes underwater. There they're pivot. Yep, there they go. They're off. As the boat came off, it re-rided, and the captain was ready to get underway on his own power. But at that point, we decided it would be much safer to just put him into a side tow and take him on in. Roger, we're in route to uh, walk over in. Side tow. Two crew members on board assessing the vessel for hull damage. It was relieving for everybody. It was one of those scenarios where, when the boat was listing to starboard, no one was really sure how that evolution was going to play out. Uh, boat could have flipped over. We could have had people in the water. Looks like we're good up there. Getting him back to port safely, it's very rewarding, knowing that we preserved his lifestyle, making it so he can continue living on his boat and still be able to fish. My name's Mel Van Long. I started fishing in 1961. What's that, 52 years now? So it's been a while. Columbia River Bar, if you got a big ebb, can be pretty bad. It was ebbing so hard, we were running full bore and barely inching over the ground. We were making no progress whatsoever. Yeah, I was aimed the right direction, but the tide had me tearing me sideways, and I didn't realize it. And the thing I was trying to avoid, which was buoy number five, is exactly where I hit the mud at. I could just see everything going with the tide, as you might say. The Coast Guard, thank God they sent that boat that had that much power. And we'd have been another 15, 20 minutes. Might have lost the boat there. Now I've had this boat for 45 years, you know, and I'm too old. I'm 73 years old. I don't want to start over again. I ain't gonna. So I, and I ain't ready to quit yet either. So I just continue on doing what I was doing. <laughs> We're headed for another trip. We're lucky it could have been a hell of a lot worse. The station received a call of a vessel taken in water. For how many persons are on board your vessel? Two. Two persons, two dogs. Eventually, it just became too much for them, and the boat capsized.
weather I got a pass down from the previous crew and it looks like there's kind of low clouds and fog, reduced visibility around, but the training area is fine. I'm Lieutenant Adrian Knies and I'm a pilot here at Sector Columbia River. It's a beautiful summer day and today I'm going on a vertical surface training flight for my co-pilot syllabus. It's important for us to do these because the area is so different than anywhere else and we have a lot of cliffs and we have a huge potential for people to get stuck on them. Mission today, it's Ms. Kinesis' uh, first time over the cliff as a uh, hoisting training flight. Ms. Kinesis will be in the left seat, I'll be in the right seat. All right. This is my first air station and I've only been flying for a couple of months. My dad took me up for a flight. He's a Army pilot. Uh, he flies 60s as well. And he took me for a cross country. We went from Colorado to Texas. And when we came back, I knew that's what I wanted to do. My name is Lieutenant Commander Nathan Coulter. I'm an instructor pilot and the assistant operations officer at Sector Columbia River. One of the unique opportunities we have here, especially newer pilots, is that they're able to do vertical surface hoist training, which is something that other units, if they don't have cliffs, they really can't do. UIR standby radar is good. All right, well, call when you're ready. And rescue checklist for two. The first hoist that we did was with the weight bag, and that's not a person, so it's not as nerve wracking as when the, the rescue swimmer actually goes down. As the hoist progressed, my comfort level increased significantly. Once we came off the cliff, it was nice and smooth. If you're comfortable, we will put the iron down. Get the hoist to come in. Progress. It's extremely important to maintain a steady hover because you have the rescue swimmer right below you. He can lose his grip on the cliff or the survivor. The survivor can fall. Easy lift and it's hold. It didn't feel anything different. Same feel like a hover. He's going down and it felt like a hoist. Easy forward. Lower sending to survivor. Over to survivor over the water. Right Once we complete a couple of hoists, we return back to home field, and I was just thinking about how awesome it was, and I'm looking forward to completing my right seat co-pilot syllabus. Go ahead, sir. I'm having trouble trying to get back to Chinook. I'm above the bridge on the Washington side, taking on major water. The station received a call of a vessel taken in water in the vicinity of the Washington side of the Surrey Megalair Bridge. I'm not sure if we're going to make it. OK, sir, how many persons are on board your vessel? Two. Two persons, two dogs. My name is VM2 Flavin. I work over at Station Cape Disappointment. We got underway immediately. The victims were fairly close to shore. The tide is ebbing. Whenever you're in the water in an ebbing tide, there is no way to swim against it. It will drown you. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It will drown you. Do we have any further information on the vessel? They're hand bailing right now. Uh, gray boat with like a blue ebony top, and they're right between the uh, Chinook Point and uh, the McGowan Fire. My name is Josh Bjorklund, and I'm a seaman at Coast Guard Station Cape Disappointment. We decided to use the 25-foot vessel we have just because of its speed, especially because we heard they were taking on water at a pretty decent rate. So we wanted to get there on scene as fast as possible. They're bailing by hand right now off uh, Chinook Point to McGrow Spire. My guess is that maybe they got too close and they swamped themselves, but we'll see in a second. The Columbia River and the Columbia River Bar can turn a 180 in an hour. It can be com completely flat one second and be treacherous the next second. All right, Josh, yep. probably going to do a direct tow line. We'll hook it up to the best spot we can, and then we'll just drag him out to deeper water. Probably take him right alongside into water. While we're en route, we got uh, notified that the vessel may have flipped over. Uh, there's two reporting sources from the road, uh, which we call Good Sam's or Good Samaritans. They said they're uh, about 100 yards offshore. On the Columbia River, when you have tides lining up with the river current, the current will rip four to five knots. And uh, especially when you have wind pushing in the opposite direction, that turns into incredibly steep chop that can uh, just ruin a 17-foot vessel's day pretty quickly. Eventually, it just became too much for them, and the boat capsized. Hey, Josh. Grab the binoculars and just get a good scan on the, on the shoreline. 
MT3 Derek Brandon at Coast Guard Station Cape Disappointment. When we were looking for the vessel in the when it was pretty choppy out. It's kind of hard because you get the white caps on top of the waves. And usually the underside of a boat is most of the time it's going to be white. So at first we were kind of looking at white and you would see a wave and you'd be like, oh, that might be them. Or maybe it's them over there. Negative visual. Uh, you can have them on the landline try to uh, wave us down if they see us. Over. I see a boat moving up on the shoreline over there. See it? You see like that, uh... I think that might be it, like zero, zero, zero. Right there? Yeah, what's that white? When we got there, it was probably half a mile west of where they originally said they were because of the current, like, pulling them out so fast. K27 on scene. Port side recovery. <laughs> you want a throw bag or have them swim them to us? Uh, just be ready with the flow bag. <laughs> Day 27 on scene. Port side recovery. The station received a call of a vessel taken in water well, about 200 yards out. We finally were able to pick up some of the debris in the water and then spotted the overturned vessel. You want a throw bag or have them swim them to us? Uh, just be ready with the flow bag. <laughs> Once we closed within about 100 yards of the vessel, we realized that both of the occupants were clung to the top of the vessel, holding on to two small dogs. Neither one would acknowledge our presence as we got within about 50 yards and maybe start to concern of their coherentness and how they were dealing with the weather. However, once we got close enough to tell that the current was strong at that point, that they couldn't actually let go of the vessel to wave at us to let us know they saw us for fear of slipping off. Are you guys going to be able to come to me when I get a little bit closer to you? OK. Are you guys OK besides being cold? Our main concern is obviously getting them out of the water. I didn't want them going hypothermic because we knew the water temperature with the wind, it was incredibly cold for them in the water. We had no idea how long they've been in the water. So our biggest concern was just getting them off the boat and on to our boat. Sir, I'm going to talk to you in this line. You grab onto it, I'll just pull you to the boat. Go. Not if I do, you might, might send first. It. Send it. Send it high. Heads up. Grab onto the line. Ma'am, grab onto Man, the line. Ma'am, hold on. We're going to pull you in. Ma'am, grab onto the line. All right, can you please get yourself off the vessel? Yes, if you can both hang on, that's fine. Just swim towards me. Neutral. What I was concerned is that we're going to lose one in the process of bringing somebody on board. And with the current running the way it was, I wouldn't be able to go chase the other one. Why? So I didn't want to attach to the line. Go ahead, man. One, two, three. Oh, my God. Look at that leg. Nice to see you guys. Yeah. They both appeared uh, pretty tired. Anytime you spend 30 minutes or more in the water hanging on to the hall of a vessel, not sure about the outcome of your life, it's going to be a traumatic experience. Let's bring him inside. Hey, sit down back here. We appreciate it. 87 KC, do you want to It's going to be warmer in there. Turn the heat on. You guys will sit down and try to get you warmed up. The first thing we do when we pull people out of the water is evaluate their overall condition. They were shivering. They were absolutely cold due to hypothermia. The female had bluish lips, so we went ahead and took as much gear on and put it on her because you want to contain all the body heat. Fortunately, we got on scene and found them when we did. The uh, current was ebbing that afternoon, and it was taking them quickly into an area that was inaccessible by boats. If they would have been in the water for an extra 15 minutes, they would have been to a point where we wouldn't have been able to rescue them from the water side. Do you have anybody we can call for you guys? Like maybe no, we don't. We're from Idaho. Okay. Is, it, is it your boat? Yeah. OK. I was just scared I lost Maddie. What? I lost Maddie a couple times. Day. Well, we didn't go out in an hour's time and save four lives and bring them back to the dock safely and make it home in time for dinner. It's, it's a great feeling.
That was uh, my first time I've actually got to pull someone out of the water and onto our boat. It was an incredible feeling. I've never done anything like that. Okay, guys, hey, thanks. Appreciate all of you. Chuck Brady in Idaho, and we were down doing some salmon fish. They saved our lives. They were on the ball, and we appreciate it to the man. We got an injury out here at the Gale Street Top. We need to be airlifted. We got two broken legs. The bones are sticking out. There was a news helicopter in the area. They assured us that they're not going to get in our way, and we weren't going to get in their way, so they kind of just came in and filmed some of it. We well, can see right there in that live wow. shot, they're now lowering down Amazing. this Coast Guard responder. You can just see uh, what a delicate operation this is with those trees. We're just getting back to the sunshine. Overall, a really, really nice July week ahead. That's your weather. Let's send it on over to Tony now with a check on traffic. All right, Brian, back out to Air 12. They're over Highway 6 at about milepost 35 in the Gales Creek area. There are several emergency responders on the scene here. It sounds like there is uh, someone in this area with a traumatic injury. So is this the Coast Guard? It sure is. We got an injury out here at the Gales Creek job. We're about logging. We need to be airlifted. We've got two broken legs. The bones are sticking out. Number one, number two, generators are on. Authority to take off. Sector, rescue three five is currently in a route to the report of an injured logger. I'll copy over. Brad Simmons, Air Station Astoria. Currently working a case with an injured logger about 38 miles from Portland. The ground party is operating on 22 Alpha and have a position. It was a short flight. We did learn from sector that Forest Grove Fire Department paramedics were currently on scene. And we also had a latitude and longitude mark so we could fly directly to the point. This is a mountain. I speak there's 3,000. Lieutenant Commander Nate Coulter, we'd been briefed that he had two broken legs. We didn't really have any other details about the case or what had happened to him. Uh, we knew that he's in a lot of pain. He had some serious, serious injuries. Yeah, ground party, if you got a paramedic down there, we'll need to hoist him as well. There is a paramedic there, and he'd be happy to join you. On the way out there, we talk on the radios and get amplifying information. There was a clearing way at the top, and a log got loose from up there and rolled all the way down and hit him where he was. So he just rolled right over him. Oh, nice. At Sector Columbia River, we assist with inland search and rescue missions probably uh, 20 times throughout the course of the year. The H-60 is unique to the area because we have a 200-foot long hoist cable and we can uh, lower our swimmers down and reach people that other people can't. All right, I think this might be it right here. Right up the nose, you see guys waving. It's pretty hospitable. The clear-cut area is a bunch of freshly felled trees. They're crisscross, like dropping a bunch of max sticks on the ground. Brad, you want to go down with the trail line? Yes, sir. Roger. Good There's news helicopters in the area. Very well. I have an aircraft inside at 2 o'clock. Yeah, Roger. Okay, on the TV helicopter just above you. All right, we'll uh, drop down and we'll stay below you. Brian, right back out to Air 12. They're over the area of Gales Creek, just north of Highway 6. That's a live picture, Deb, of this Coast Guard helicopter, which has just arrived in that area to assist in the response to a traumatic injury. There was a news helicopter in the area. They assured us that they're not going to get in our way, and we weren't going to get in their way, so they kind of just came in and filmed some of it. It's very difficult to get uh, some of this information together. From what we understand, they're going to lift this person up and transport this person to a hospital. Man, just be advised, they are ready for your descent. Okay, just give an eye to the back of the helicopter. You know, look for obstacles and any other safety concerns. We had to descend to uh, within 10 feet of the trees, so a stable hover is crucial. Roger, and swimmer is ready. Roger, begin hoist. Swimmer's going out the door for load check. As I'm going out the door, I say a Lord's Prayer and a quick Hail Mary. Load check complete. Swimmer's going down. And then I just focus on the spot that I want to put my feet down. Swimmer's going down. Flight spin. I am William Jones. I'm a flight mechanic. Upon lowering the swimmer down, he started spinning a little bit. My first priority is making sure that he's not going to hit anything. And also, uh, at the same time, making sure that the helicopter's not going to hit anything either. 
Well, you can see right there in that live wow. shot, they're now lowering down Amazing. this Coast Guard responder. You can just see uh, what a delicate operation this is with those trees. Summer's about 30 feet above the surface. Roger. I'm in the orange on my uh, cable. In the last 20 feet of cable we have and the 200 feet of usable cable, uh, it's all painted orange. Summer's going down. I'm almost at the ground, find a decent spot where I can put my feet down um, and then tend the trail line, and I come to a stop. Oh, we were out of cable. So our initial hoisting position ended up being about 220 feet, and then we had to come down a little bit lower. Copy down, and it's uh, four clear. Roger, and slitter down. Pilots started uh, slowly maneuvering the helicopter down below some of the treetops. And clear down. Constantly looking back at the uh, tail rotor, making sure that our clearances were still OK. Clear down. And Summer is on deck. And Summer's clearing some debris away from him. That's the work for him trying to get around all those logs, I imagine. Once I get down there, there is a first responder from Forest Grove. And my priority is to start the hoisting evolution. I try and get the paramedic up to the plane. That gives me an opportunity to get the patient into the litter, which does take some time. The best is going up to Captain Dorsey. Roger. All right, I'm ready for pickup signal. Roger. And I assume it's probably been his first time ever being hoisted into a helicopter. On about 60 feet, I can see the panic in his eyes. Bring him inside the cabin. And medic is out of the basket, hoist complete. And looks like he's connecting the hook to the litter. And I have ready for pickup signal. Take the load. Once they start taking up the cable, we use the 210-foot trail line to keep the swing to a minimum. I was about halfway up. Just applause to the Coast Guard. This is just one of the most amazing rescues we've seen here on Good Day Oregon uh, in a long time. Survivor's coming up. And bring a survivor inside the cabin. Fortunately, we were able to held a stable hover there and you know pull them up and, and not run into any real problems. Summer is coming up the cabin door. Summer's at the cabin door. Summer coming inside the cabin. So I got the rescue swimmer back into the cabin. He and the paramedic began assessing the patient further. So we got Justin here, 26 years old. He was hit by a rolling log coming down the hill. Took out both of his legs. He's got an open right femur fracture, also a gross deformity in the knee on the left. The patient was stable. We added another dressing to minimize the bleeding. He described his pain as 6 out of 10. If that was 6 out of 10 and he had uh, two majorly broken legs, uh, that's a, one tough individual there. All right, guys, uh, we'll make an approach to fuel pad here. We got door speed. Roger, cabin door's coming open. Our transit time to the hospital was 10 minutes. We brought the gurney up, transferred the uh, litter right under the gurney, and rolled him right into the ER. Nice hoisting, Will. Good job. Thank you, sir. Yeah, bringing uh, the patient up, he really maintained his cool. It definitely feels good to help somebody like that in a situation as terrible as that one was. Better go in there, Brad. It was uh, pretty deformed. Both, uh, both legs were pointed backward. Now that I think about it, I remember not seeing his feet sticking up in the blankets. We have a biohazard in the cabin. There's a lot. It feels good to get somebody out of a situation that they didn't have any other way out of and get them to a higher level of care and allow them to actually get on with their life after this all wraps up. My name's Justin Johnson. I was logging, and uh, here's my story. I had a logging accident. We were at a Gales Creek, Oregon. I noticed about during the foot of the tree, it's cooking down the hill. And eventually it got down like 20 feet away crossing, going a totally different direction. It hit an old growth stump, turned right at me at 100 miles an hour. I jumped, but it just ran right through me. Next thing I know, I was walking on my hands because my legs were just out this way. Bones and blood, it's crazy. My leg was hanging off. About like skin. <clears throat> At that moment, I didn't even want to think about my legs. I just told Caleb I'm not going to make it. Tell my family I love them. I just thought it was plain and simple that I would die right there in the spot. At that time, help wasn't even wasn't fathomable, you know. Caleb jumps on me right away. Try stopping the blood. Medic people show up. 
So they get me in the litter. After I got repelled down, start hoisting me up. Covered blankets and all that. You guys go to crazy lengths to save people, and I thank them for that. If they didn't, I probably, probably could have died. I feel like I'm progressing pretty quick. Getting my feeling back a lot. Later, I'll be back to riding dirt bikes and back to skateboarding and back to chasing around my little girls. I got a second chance and I, I'm gonna run with it. <laughs>
Whoa, what? 120 S, I thought I heard 20. 120. A lot of people. Yeah. Lieutenant Jesse Culver, um, H-60 Aircraft Commander, historian. We were uh, returning from a uh, training flight when Sector Command Center Ted fires out of control. That's when our hearts kind of like skipped a beat, and we were like, oh, it's game on. This might be a multi-crew event, launch two aircraft at the same time. At that point, we uh, started planning immediately about how we could most effectively get on scene. come back to home field, we find out that, considering the vast amount of people, they're launching another 60. Hey, refueling up! Hey. While we're refueling, we decided to bring a burn kit, as well as a mash casualty raft. If there are going to be a lot of people in the water, it's the best idea to get them out of it. Got the other aircraft in sight, one three turning. Roger. Crew party to take off. Ready for takeoff. We are airborne at this time, en route, Arctic storm, how copy. Yeah, I will pass out a lot, thank you. So we are, how far out? Uh, 20 minutes. Okay. So this is my first case in the right seat. And what was going through my mind was, holy crap, uh, I hope I don't screw this up. But I'm glad that my training has prepared me for this situation. I want to make sure we have eyes on from the air at all times if they go in the water to make sure people don't drift away. AMT3, William Jones, flight mechanic here at Sector Columbia River. Before we get on scene, we're just preparing for the worst case scenario. Uh, in this case, people jumping overboard, the uh, boat being fully engulfed in flames. Got the boat inside, it's up and now it's about one o'clock. Yeah, Roger, you can start coming down. Coming down. Their smoke is pretty good off the back end. When we got on scene, there was smoke still coming out of the, the smokestacks, but most of the fire is actually in, inside the engine room. You can see uh, where it's hot in the engine room, for sure. Yeah, definitely. AC3 Ty Ganzel, rescue swimmer here at Air Station Astoria, Oregon. That's a huge ship. It's a lot of fuel in that thing. I mean, just think of how much oil and gas and just flammable items that are down in the engine room. A lot of people. Yeah, it does look like they're wearing very uh, protective gear there, huh? I'm trying to look to see if maybe they have Gumby suits ready on deck. I don't see anything, man. The water's cold up here, so if that thing caught on fire really bad or blew up, they did have to jump in the water. They can just drop down on the vitals really quick. And you have to get in there and just hoist some people off from there, because you're not just going to have them all jump into the water freely. That's just dangerous. They're smoking pretty good off the back end. Yeah, it does look like they're wearing very uh, protective gear there, huh? I'm trying to look to see if maybe they have Gumby suits ready on deck. I don't see anything, man. The fishing vessel Arctic Storm it had an engine fire. I mean, a vessel that size with 120 people, once they get in the water, especially if they have burns and stuff, they can just drop down on the vitals really quick, and you have to pluck them out really fast, transfer them. Oh, 47's here. There's a lot of boats out here. There is. We're used to kind of getting on the scene, being the only game in town, and trying to grab everybody. That would not be possible in this case. This is more of a effective mass casualty type uh, drill with multiple assets on scene. There was numerous good SAMs. Their sister ships were on scene as well. And uh, we had three 47s on scene, and then the other 16. I mean, it was 120 people. If things get worse, I want to be able to go and respond. Is uh, how I'm thinking. Roger. Coast Guard helicopter, Arctic Storm. We came on scene, and within 10 minutes, the captain decides to release Halon into the engine compartment space. And Halon is basically an extinguishing agent for Class Bravo fires, which is fuel or oil. Coast Guard helicopter, Arctic Storm. Arctic Storm, Captain, go ahead. Looks like the Halon is doing its job here. We're just idle here right now, evaluating the situation, what their next step is going to be. The Halon did suppress the fire, but you never know. Stuff can reflash at any given point. 
106 south and we will not go past the hip. Because we had two 60s, we determined that we need to split the airspace just in case the fire does not extinguish or if it reflashes and they jump into the water or people get hurt. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's some more black smoke coming out. Now they just open a hatch. Oh, they must have just opened yeah, to air it out. Coast Guard helicopter, Arctic Storm. Looks like it's still smoking down there, maybe a little heat, so I want to coordinate getting some uh, non essential personnel off the boat. Boat to boat, or would you prefer us to uh, hoist them off? It seems like the safer bet is to transfer them boat to boat. Oh, it's way safer. I think boat to boat's gonna work. I can talk yeah, to some of these guys here and see if we can arrange something that way. The captain decided to have non essential personnel leave the boat in the event that the fire was not contained. And they were using a Jacob's ladder into a small boat from their sister ships. Our job here right now is in case all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and everyone starts jumping in the water. And we're the best bet to pick out individual people that drift away from everyone else because we can actually see them. It's always hard going from one ship that's moving to another one. There's a risk of falling in between those two boats going into the water. So we remained on scene just to make sure that they were safe. So all of them are off, right? I think so. Crew 9 Inspector, you can RTB at this time. The crew is in disembarking. Once all the non-essential personnel were taken aboard their sister ships and we found that the fire was under control, Sector let us return home. And Sector from the U-29, oh, Roger. That sounds great. See you in about approximately three zero minutes. Two nine out. Hey, Joanne did great. It's one of those cases that once in a lifetime, she may not see anything like this again in her career, but uh, she handled herself real well, and I hope she goes on to, to bigger and better things. It was a wonderful feeling knowing that everyone was aboard their sister ship safely. I'm extremely fortunate to be a pilot in the Coast Guard to where I can use my talent and experiences to assist people in need.